We're just going to go in circles tonight, everyone. Yeah, so sorry, it's been that kind of month. So hi, everyone. I'm Brandy Chambers. I'm part of the management committee with the feds. And uh, we're really excited for tonight because I am introducing Roger, who is a professor emeritus at Miami University. Don't really know what that means, but it's in psychology. So I'm thinking he's a lot smarter than everybody here on the call, including me. So yay for Roger. He's been retired since 2010. And since then, he has devoted himself to climate activism. He chairs the DFW um, chapter of the Climate Reality Project. He is the team leader for the Climate Rats team of, as part of the feds. And he has been heavily involved in kind of do, helping the feds since 2017. He will be introducing our other guests talking about climate tonight. Thank you so much, Roger. Take it over. Randy, thank you for that. And uh, hello, feds. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure for me uh, personally to welcome uh, the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability back for what it will be their third presentation uh, to the feds, talking about the city of Dallas's comprehensive environmental and climate action plan, which we all know uh, fondly as CCAP. Um, I think we have three members of, of the uh, OEQS team on with us tonight, uh, Susan Alvarez, uh, Brittany Haley-Wells, and Far Andrews. Uh, before I turn it over to them, uh, let me just invite everybody who might have questions during their presentation, drop those in the chat, please. I'll try to keep up with them and, and, um, and get as many of them over to the team from OEQS as, as possible after we hear their presentation. I've said every time they come that, that because they work for the city, they don't get to talk about politics but since I'm a member of the feds, I'm under no such restriction. So I wanna make a few um, opening remarks uh, just by way of context. Um, we've come through 2020. Uh, I'm sure you know that, that it was often talked about as a year of intersecting crises. We had a global healthcare crisis caused by the COVID virus that in turn sparked a massive economic crisis that quickly turned into a disaster for a great many people, including a great many people in our community here in Dallas. Trump's attempt to destroy American democracy, uh, a crisis in its own right was, was thankfully defeated at the polls, but we know that fight continues. And all, and at the same time that all of that was going on, the climate crisis only got worse and worse. These are the facts. 2020, according to NASA, there was a little squabble about it, but NASA says hottest year ever, and I'm going with NASA. That means the last seven years are the hottest seven years ever recorded by instruments on the planet. 2020 set an all-time record in the United States for billion dollar weather and climate related disasters. There were 20 named tropical storms, 12 of which hit the US. Wildfires burned 4.78 million acres in the Western United States. The previous record was only 1.98 million. We saw the first ever million acre mega fire last year. Across the Midwest, derecho winds in excess of 140 miles an hour across Iowa and Illinois, which are too flat to stop any wind, caused $6.5 billion in damage. And the mega drought across the Rocky Mountain Southwest just continued to deepen. And of course, the disasters aren't limited to the United States. Typhoon Goyne hit the Philippines with winds in excess of 195 miles an hour. That's just unimaginable. A new record, it's the third time the record uh, for speeds and uh, wind speed and typhoons has been broken in the last eight years. Fires of course ravaged Australia, not just the Western United States and many other parts of the world. Floods on the Yangtze River did $32 billion worth of damage in China and displaced more than 20 million people. 
ice melted, sea levels rose. And by this point, if you're like me, your mind just starts to go numb and you glaze over because it's, it's almost too much to take in. But don't despair because we know that solutions to the climate crisis are possible if governments take big action quickly. And the really good news is that the Biden-Harris administration has made the climate crisis a central focus for their administration. I think we're all looking forward to their forthcoming infrastructure plan that promises to address not just carbon pollution, but environmental justice and in the process, create millions of jobs. Much of that plan necessarily is going to focus on cities in America. That's where the vast majority of people live. That's where the vast majority of energy gets consumed. That's where pollution gets generated. And all of that is context for CCAP. As I assume most of you know, the plan was passed unanimously by city council last May, but a plan is nothing but a roadmap. It doesn't guarantee that action is gonna be taken. So tonight we're gonna to get an update on what's happened since last May in terms of starting to implement CCAP. And with city council elections coming up, feds, listen very carefully because where we go from here is gonna depend very much on just how well the new council members understand the need for urgent action to solve the climate crisis. There is simply no time left for this city or any city to kick the can on down the road a year or two. We need leaders in city council who will make CCAP the top priority going forward. So it's a real privilege for me to uh, introduce Susan Alvarez from the Office of uh, Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Sue, welcome back to the feds. I'll turn it over to you and uh, screen sharing is enabled. Again, everybody Yay. questions in the All chat. All right, so please. that's my first test. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, feds. We call you guys the funky feds. Um, and you are one of our favorite groups to come talk to because you usually know as much or more than we do. Um, and Roger just did probably most of my introduction, but that's okay. Because um, that means I can talk about some other stuff. And are you all seeing my screen? Okay. Everything's clear. Yay. Okay. So um, it has been a while. It's really fun. I looked at one of my older presentations and I'm like, gosh, we've come a long way. And we've come a long way largely because uh, of the help that we get from feds, from uh, Sierra Club, from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby and a bunch of our community partners, and we really appreciate that help. So I'm gonna dive in, um, kind of give you a, an overview of where we are today, a little bit of insight on the climate mayors and the White House, kind of what's driving us right now. Um, the, the big meat of our presentation is on our implementation plan. Uh, but I wanted to give you um, some ideas of some of the other things that we're doing relative to making sure that we're moving forward and relative to making sure that we're um, appropriately engaging the community as we go, which, as you know, in the time of COVID, can be challenging. So first of all, we are up to 474 different mayors across the U.S., that have pledged to uphold the climate goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, the good news is, is Jean McCarthy in the White House uh, Office of Climate, I think that's what it's called, um, has had several calls now with the climate mayors and will be working with the climate mayors to move their agenda forward. I'm really excited that they are embedding climate into the Office of Labor, the Law Office of Energy, um, they've got Deb Haaland in public lands. They're just making a lot of really good moves relative to the environment. And so that, that makes me hopeful. Um, one of the things most people don't know is we're not the only city in Texas that is working on climate plans. Uh, these are the cities that have major plans in place. 
We do talk to them fairly regularly. I, I spoke with the lady from the city of Houston this morning, as a matter of fact, um, and we coordinate with them on things like legislative agendas, um, community solar group purchasing, that sort of thing. And then um, I'll talk a little bit more about this. This is kind of a fuzzy map, but we're not even the only city in North Texas looking at climate planning. And I'm really excited about that because um, our first time around, we were so proud of ourselves because we had reduced our own emissions. And then we looked at the emissions across the community versus the city of Dallas, and we're only about 2%. And then if you look across the region, we're only about maybe 10, 15% of the emissions. And so we really can't do this without good partnerships in our community and good partnerships with our neighboring cities. As Roger said, and I don't have the updated map for this, but Texas leads the country in all 10 categories of disasters that uh, NOAA tracks. Um, 2000, 2020 was a stellar year. Um, and for what I'm hearing, our adventures with Snowmageddon um, is probably equal to or more so to Hurricane Harvey. And so 2021 is gonna be another billion dollar year and we're only in March. Um, I'm seeing Jennifer's picture here and it's really lovely, but it's right in front of where I need to show something. So here's the deal. Um, this is um, annual numbers of events in these different categories and dollars cost, cost in billions over here. And we've got a nice exponential curve across all kinds of um, types of adventures. And the last three years, not including 2020, have been at or above 400 billion per year across the United States. That's a lot of money. And it's a lot of money that we could do a whole lot of other things with. Um, and it also is a lot of money that if we weren't spending it on cleanup, we could put in a whole lot of solar and other things that it could help us move forward. One of the other things people are asking about, they're like, well, I thought it was global warming. How come we just froze our butts off? Um, and the explanation is, is that our poles are warming and so the difference in temperature between the poles and the rest of the globe is less. And so that allows that jet stream to wiggle around, which means the colder air can come farther south than it normally does. And so our Snowmageddon adventures are yet another example of impacts of climate change where we get much greater variability one of the other things that's kind of entertaining, um, and I, I pulled this just because it's entertaining. This is a 2019 breakdown on fuel across ERCOT. You'll notice that probably 60% of it is coal. Our, our, our February, coal and natural gas, carbon-based fuels. Um, we did have a perfect storm. We exceeded the max demand that was predicted by about 20%. We had a 35% reduction in coal and gas power. We had only a 20% reduction in wind and it really isn't a large generator. The thing that I thought was really um, ironic is um, the nuke plant went offline um, because the cooling tower froze and you can't operate a nuke plant without a cooling tower. So it was, too cold even for nukes. And then the thing that's probably critical um, is that the wholesale energy costs increased 10,000%. And I think that's probably a case without me getting too political of the fox looking after those chickens. With that, we'll go on to uh, more of our pathway. Some of you are around when Brittany and Kevin did the very first North Texas Climate Change Symposium. From that, um, we did a climate change resolution. We adopted green energy. And then we started out on our journey towards developing a climate plan. 
Uh, last year, we did our third, although it was virtual. We originally had planned to adopt the CCAP on Earth Day, um, but making sure that we had enough public input into the plan, we delayed it a month just so that people could have a, a look at it. One of the things that was in the adoption of the CCAP is when we were talking to the community, there was a very strong desire to make sure that there was a way to have public input into the CCAP through implementation. And they also wanted that input to reflect the different areas of the CCAP, but also the different areas of the city. Um, they wanted a diverse group. And there were quite a few that wanted us to do a permanent commission. The commission process in Dallas, for whatever reason, takes 12 to 18 months. We didn't want to have a break in input, even with COVID. And so we did a task force. And um, I'm really proud of the task force. It's a very diverse group. We have um, people from, um, well, our good friend Ariman from Sunrise Movement is participating, but we also have Phil Crone from the Builders Association. So again, kind of like our initial stakeholder committee, we've got everybody at the table talking together and we've had really, really good meetings, really, really good input from them into our uh, implementation plan and into um, the recommendations for a permanent environmental commission for Dallas. Um, we developed and implemented uh, an implementation plan to kind of guide the activities in actually getting stuff done under this plan. Uh, CCAP was unanimously adopted. Uh, the whole thing around our plan is that it's equity-based. The other thing is everything is measurable and everything is common sense. We're not doing crazy stuff, we're doing Dallas stuff. Um, as you know, the first step in any plan is to get a handle on your greenhouse gas emissions. The majority of ours are buildings and energy and transportation. Those are three areas that theoretically should be easy to get our arms around to reduce those emissions. Again, environmental justice is at the middle. Um, not all climate plans are built the same. We started out focusing on adaptation which is how do we make things better and how do we fix our infrastructure so we don't freeze to death in the dark and then have broken water lines. And mitigation, where we're reducing the emissions that are driving climate change. But as we started looking at solutions, we realized that the environmental quality piece was really critically important because the role of our natural environment and the role that nature-based solutions provide in an urban setting. So this is kind of mind boggling and it's probably not reading, readable, but we ended up with eight different focus areas. Um, and in each area, we set some goals and we set some targets. Um, and this is so that it's not just a pretty plan that sits on the shelf. We've got some direction. We have some specific things that we wanna do with this plan. Uh, these are some of the targets that we've got. And we started out our poor consultants, we made them look at 20 existing plans to start and then benchmark what we already were doing with what other cities were doing. And I think they ended up with like 400 different actions to start with. And so we screened them. We wanted mitigation actions, we wanted adaptation, environmental quality, we have several actions in the plan that are focused on environmental justice. And then we said, well, wait a minute, that's not really enough. We still have, I think like 250. So then we started looking at co-benefits, things like cost savings, improving air quality, creating jobs, reducing energy poverty, reducing greenhouse gas, uh, encouraging environmental stewardship. So we ended up with 97 actions across eight different sectors. And it was through this screening in the, in the co-benefits so that we get the most bang for the buck at the end of the day. If you've had the pleasure of reading the CCAP, 
this is kind of what it looks like for each one of those 97 actions. There's kind of a very brief description of what's there, the primary benefit, those co-benefits. And then it was really interesting. Last summer, um, we got invited to a seminar uh, with the USGBC about equity and climate planning. And I um, got kind of nervous and I invited our equity officer to sit in with me in case there were questions that I wouldn't be able to answer about our equity office. Well, it turns out they were holding up Dallas as the poster child for equity um, because we had screened all of our activities under an equity lens so that we knew if it was gonna, if there were things that we needed to do to make sure that underserved neighborhoods um, could take advantage of some of the actions in the CCAP. And apparently we were the only Texas city that did that. So now Austin is redoing theirs with an equity climate plan. So um, come budget time, our city manager and our budget office thought it'd be really great if we tackled 92% of the actions in the 30 year climate plan our first year out of the gate. And FAR and team and I all did a really deep intake of breath and started kind of hyperventilating um, and, and let them know that this is a 30 year plan um, and a lot of these things have a lot of steps that won't be done all in one year. And so we worked with our task force and we worked with our council committee um, to do the implementation work plan for this year. And in this plan, we're actually tackling about half of the actions. And then we've got 136 different milestones that we're working on with 19 different departments. Um, we've got a quarterly monitoring program set up. Right now, the Q1, which is the end of December, um, we've got about 56 of our milestones are already started. A lot of those are uh, ongoing actions, um, but they're in progress. We're working on it and we've completed 15%. So I think that's a first quarter of the year and you don't have a plan until the second month of that corner, um, I'm pretty pleased with where we are. Um, I don't know, I think Brittany's on here. Brittany is our website maven, among other things. She set up our Dallas Climate Action website and she has set up a, a dashboard so that you can go in and see where we are on the different uh, actions that we've got in this year's plan. The other thing is, is that the CCAP made the radar for the city manager, and he also has performance measures on the CCAP, on the Dallas 365. I will warn you though, the Dallas 365 dashboard um, tracks progress monthly. And to be perfectly honest, because we have 19 departments, just from a sheer data management standpoint, we're only reporting quarterly right now. So the other thing that we've got, and it's been really, really helpful, is we do have an environment and sustainability committee. It's the first time the city has had an environmentally focused council committee, and they have been extremely supportive, but they've also pushed us. And I think that's really good. And it's a way of making sure that things are on track, making sure that we are accountable and making sure that things in the CCAP are getting done. Um, it, the meetings are publicized. It's every first Monday of the month at 9 a.m. And you can sign into WebEx and listen in. Um, and, and you can keep up with a lot of the things that we're go, doing uh, through that committee. The other group that has been really helpful and one of the first things that we did under the committee is we um, developed an environment and sustainability task force. Um, you can see our stellar leaders on that, and that's um, former council member uh, Sandy Grayson and Rita Beving, um, chair and co-chair respectively. Um, and then we've got 15 community members and subject matter experts. The scope of the work for the task force is really twofold. Um, one is to advise us on environment, sustainability, and implementing the CCAP. 
and the other is to develop the infrastructure and the scope for a permanent commission. And I will tell you, we just presented the draft requirements or draft recommendations from the task force to our Environment and Sustainability Commission uh, last month. Uh, we anticipate pulling together the draft ordinance um, on uh, April 5th and take this forward to council for approval by May. And so we should have that permanent environmental commission uh, in place within like a couple of months. One thing, and this may be a little bit hard to read because I've got a lot of stuff on it. Um, I wanted to share what we're looking at right now. This is the draft recommendations, and that's 15 voting members of the general public, eight non-voting members, which means they don't necessarily have to be a, a resident of Dallas for technical experts. That would be one for each sector of the CCAP. We're looking for environmental experience, two years minimum of neighborhood environmental advocacy, and we're looking for people that live in the neighborhoods that they're trying to represent. Um, we found that sometimes some neighborhoods have well-meaning folks, but they don't live there and they may not really actually understand some of the concerns in some of our neighborhoods. Um, we're also looking for public health experience. Um, one of the things that we got uh, during the development for the recommendations on this task force is we got a lot of public input, um, either wanting us to re-stand up the Environmental Health Commission or to make sure that there was an environmental health aspect to the regular um, Environmental Commission. And so to, to answer that, because there are financial implications of setting up commissions, and we've been asked to set up one, um, we're setting up an environmental commission with a standing committee to address environmental health issues. So in other words, that's a regular committee. It'll meet monthly. Whatever comes up from an environmental health standpoint, they will tackle. And I think that will be helpful. And then other committees as determined necessary. It could be that we bring in things from the, the urban forest master plan. Um, one of the other things is um, some of our council members had concerns about commissions that kind of went through their mission but kept going, even though they weren't necessarily really doing a whole lot. And so we added a measure to review the environmental commission for efficacy after two years and then every two years after that. And, and that way there's a, a little bit of accountability on the commission as well, to make sure they're meeting the needs of the community and meeting the needs of the council. Internally, and this is where um, Katie Evans has been really helpful. So we have 19 departments involved with doing these CCAP actions and reporting and um, developing their plans for next year. So we um, converted what was the Environmental Planning Committee that helped develop the CCAP into LEAF, which is Leading Environmental Action Forward. It is um, representatives from the 19 departments that are implementing CCAP actions um, and other related planning efforts. We have some other ongoing plans um, and with this committee, it's, it's possible for us to make sure that as those plans develop, that they appropriately incorporate environmental action related to the CCAP. Um, and this goes back to Dallas Climate Action. So what we have done is set up a page for each one of the um, focus areas and you can drill down and look at the measurable outcomes, the targets, and then those actions that we're actually working on. So with that, I'm gonna quickly dive through the eight areas. I'm probably not gonna go in um, enough detail for you, um, but kind of go through the objectives, what our targets are, this little number in the circle to the right, I think it's the right, 
is the number of actions within this focus area. So if we're buildings, we want them to be energy efficient and climate resilient. We just got a very recent exercise in understanding why that is critically important, not just in the summer, but also in the winter. Um, there is, and I can't be political, um, you will note that we have a target of net zero energy in new construction. There is a house bill on the floor Thursday that may limit our ability to do that. Um, and with that, I would go to why it matters. And that is um, buildings account for the highest percentage of our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, buildings and energy together are at 64%. Of these, 33 from commercial, 20 from home. And we have a relatively small industrial sector compared to other cities. Um, when we were doing the plan, we were mostly focused on warmer temperatures. Um, we have come to understand that cold temperatures can also be challenging. So the four areas or the four actions where we're actively working um, this year, under the building sector, we're working with aviation to continue their airport carbon accreditation program. Our own zero waste program has an existing green business certification. We're working to expand that. Um, we're working regionally um, with the COG and others on updating the building code. And um, this last one, B15, we're looking at in earnest now. Um, during the snowmageddon, uh, we had folks in shelters that then flooded and lost power. And so we really need to look at um, both rebuilding um, our, some of our facilities that were significantly damaged, but also our new buildings. Um, we're looking at developing them as resilient hubs so that when the power goes out, um, they can be self-sufficient, that they won't freeze and their pipes won't freeze. So th this one becomes even more critical than we thought it was when we put it in the plan. Under energy, um, we're, we um, want renewable, reliable and affordable energy. And this is huge. Um, so, our goals, and I think this is actually incorrect. I don't think it's megawatt hours. I think it's kilowatt hours because um, megawatt hours is written as probably more than the whole state of Texas. But um, what we're trying to do is increase the amount of local solar power generated so that it is locally generated and not having to come across the transmission lines from West or South Texas. Um, we're looking at concerns of energy poverty and we're looking at trying to get more people onto renewable electricity plants. Not all homes in Dallas um, have sufficient structure to support solar. And 58% of our residents in Dallas actually rent. And so um, in, in the absence of being able to implement solar power on a home, the next best thing is to support that market by um, enrolling into a renewable energy plan. Um, let me skip that one. Under energy, um, House Bill 17 would preclude us from doing action E3, um, working with energy providers to provide uh, education on renewable energy. Um, we are currently working on E5 and 6 on trying to implement a community solar program. We got a grant from the U.S. Department of Energy um, for technical assistance. Uh, we're working from the recommendations in that grant to take it forward. Um, this is an area where we got some uh, funding from council last year is to try to to get a renewable energy program, particularly for our lower and moderate income uh, homes. Um, continue green energy. And then E10, um, I'm in, in the process of doing right now, which is look, advocating for renewable energy policies at the state and federal level. Transportation is our single largest uh, group where we have emissions 
and it is the single largest uh, number of actions. I know Roger would like us to like increase the number of available EV charging by about tenfold. And we do have grants uh, for implementing some EV outlets. Um, and we are working with uh, the COG and others um, we also got a grant towards uh, installing our own EV chargers and towards uh, purchase of fuel efficient vehicles as part of our fleet. Um, part of our uh, work plan for the year includes uh, doing a fleet conversion study so that we can, as the vehicles need to be replaced, uh, purchase the appropriate uh, electrified fleet replacement uh, as we move forward. And then we're also looking uh, with, and I'm gonna go ahead and scoot over. Um, this is where we've got some vulnerability from flooding. Um, our probably biggest climate vulnerability is flooding. And these are major road segments that are out of commission if we get the future 100 year um, storms. So um, super commuting cities, this is high speed rail, it is electric, it would take a big chunk of the travel between Houston and Dallas off the roads. It is much less polluting than the air travel that makes that route. Um, we are working with our friends in uh, transportation towards a strategic mobility plan. Um, it's generally okay, I think they can probably go a little bit farther. Um, but that's okay, we'll keep pestering them. And then um, sustainable development is actually doing some fantastic work right now related to reducing parking minimums, um, increasing the amount of green infrastructure in parking. And they're actually even looking at greening factors, which is um, a practice of uh, biophilia for the building itself to offset uh, parking. And so they're really taking a big leap, um, much farther than we thought they would relative to um, addressing our, our parking ordinance. Um, and so that's, that's a place where we're actually going a little bit farther than we anticipated. I'm not gonna stop them. Um, and so, and then our police department um, in the interest of um, using money to help make neighborhoods safer is converting and installing LED traffic lights and street lights. There are three auxiliary plans. All three of these plans are on the street right now looking for comments. I highly suggest that you visit them. Um, the, the Public Works Sidewalk Master Plan in particular, I think is pretty critical because we got feedback that more people would walk and bike if the streets were a little friendlier to uh, pedestrians. And so that plan is pretty critical. The mobility plan um, ties in, it's kind of a bridge between COG and what our public works folks do, um, has some generally good ideas. And then DART is right now reimagining their bus routes and they also have plans and surveys on the street. This one is critical. Um, it's really hard to get people out of single occupancy vehicles if they don't have convenient transit or other routes of transportation. So um, this is, it's really interesting. The solid waste category um, is the one that has the most interest and probably the least uh, amount of impact on emissions. Um, we have nine actions in this uh, part of the plan. We're trying to reduce our organic waste, our paper waste, and overall the amount of waste going to the landfill by 2030. And we're, we're trying, I will go back, we're trying to do that to go beyond recycling um, and like reducing the amount of material in the first place, um, reduce, reuse, repair. And so we're looking at more, more R's than recycling um, and trying to get more um, more out of our waste prior to it going out to my friends up the commas. And this is kind of an interesting thing because it's a map of low income areas and landfills. Hmm. What do you know? And I'll just let it go with that. Um, so we are looking at 
uh, promoting source reduction. We're working with our friends in sanitation um, towards separating um, bulk of brush. Um, they're gonna be doing a pilot and I don't remember the neighborhood. It's a relatively small neighborhood um, to, to see um, if they can get the neighborhood for whatever reason, we've had a lot of pushback. People like being able to put their bulky waste out every month. Um, but we're trying to get it separated and do like on call. Um, they're going to pilot it first before they roll it out across the city. We're also working with them to update the local solid waste management plan. Um, that plan was done in 2013. It was a great idea in 2013. It doesn't necessarily uh, reflect current practice or the current recycling market. Um, the other things that we're doing is uh, working with our procurement office on green procurement. Again, we're gonna be doing some pilots and doing some work with a lot of the departments that do a lot of purchasing. Um, and we've done a lot of research into what other cities are doing relative to green procurement. My friends in the water department um, really shamed most of the other departments in the city they typically plan at minimum for a 50 year horizon. And so when we started looking at their plans uh, to conserve and protect water resources, et cetera, they already had these 20 and 30 year plans. So it made it pretty easy um, to take a look at the targets that they already have, take a look at some of the things they're already doing. Now, the one place that we kind of ratcheted things up a little bit is, um, on greenhouse gas emissions from the treatment facilities. Right now they have cogeneration on the sludge digester out at uh, Central. Actually it's at the Southeast, um, but it takes sludge from Central. Um, half of the power for that plant, and it's a really big plant, it's a 385 million gallon per day plant, comes from the sludge. And so that's, that is a really good way of diverting those emissions and using them uh, for local power in essence, but we kind of want to raise the bar on them uh, so that they can reduce their emissions and their power needs even more. Um, so the water sector, water is probably going to be the oil of the future. In fact, if you look at it on a gallon by gallon basis, it's, it's as expensive or more so. Um, we have a good plan but we have to be smart about how we use our water resources. And um, the, the challenge to our friends in the water world is going from low precipitation droughts to single storm events that are crazy like in 2015. So a lot of the actions in water are kind of keeping on keeping on. And we do have a lot that we're actually working on this year in the water sector, mainly because we're working on them. Um, and this is where, when we were quantifying what all we were doing to feed, to, um, I'm sorry, to um, Moody's, uh, who was asking what we were doing um, relative to adaptation to reduce our climate risk, most of the costs that we counted came from the water sector. This is my favorite realm and that is green spaces. We've got nine different actions in this world. Um, what we want to do is leverage green space to provide climate adaptation benefits, mental health, etc. Um, we just completed the urban forest master plan. We have goals of increasing our overall canopy and green cover. Um, when you increase your green area, you increase your air quality, you um, improve your um, flood response for the watershed. And there are significant, both heat island and um, just general aesthetic benefits by increasing your green space, including air quality. So we have several goals there. Um, I saw one today that I really liked. And so when we get to a point where we have to update this, um, it was a 330, 300. It was like three trees per yard, 300 feet to a park. And I, I don't remember the other one, but it made a lot of sense. And it was probably easier to remember than the goals we have. 
Here's a lot of our parks. Um, the challenge is a lot of our parks aren't necessarily where the people are. That big white area is West Dallas. It's like the heart of our heat island. Um, a lot of it is fairly industrial, but I think that we can, it's also one of the areas with Joe's Creek that floods the most. And so I think we have some opportunities to um, use green space to improve our overall uh, quality of life in Dallas. So we've got blue green is, com is combining drainage infrastructure with green infrastructure. That's my parking lots that my friends in sustainable development are redoing for me. Um, we're in the process of getting the urban forest master plan approved and we're working with the city manager's office and those applicable departments towards how that gets implemented. There's, I think, a little bit of concern there. Um, we are currently working with Texas Trees, the Nature Conservancy, and others um, relative to tree planting, protecting trees and prairies, um, promoting drought tolerant landscapes. Um, Parks is doing all kinds of pilots right now with electric equipment, um, using integrated pest management to reduce the amount of pesticides they use. Um, they're just doing a lot of pretty innovative uh, things in their world that we're hoping that the other departments in the city will adopt. Um, so there's our forest plan. And I believe it's online if you would like to read it. We're trying to get it finalized by the end of the month, if practicable. And the goals under that are to create a healthy, equitable, and resilient forest. Uh, we want to grow our canopy. We want to, to meet uh, the CCAP targets. And we want to engage the community uh, relative to everyone owning the urban forest and making trees a priority. Food, um, and it's really interesting, the food sector, we were originally uh, thinking that it was the food deserts that we knew about. And then COVID hit and we realized that we have a lot of families that are one paycheck away from a food bank. Um, and so we understand now that we've got some challenges, whether related to the supply chain. Um, and so we need to improve food access. We really need to reduce food miles and try to encourage more local food production. Um, the food system, it's not just extreme weather events, it's other stressors like COVID. Um, and then th this is the, the issue of food waste is a cross sector issue with both trying to reduce the organics going to the landfill under the waste sector and addressing getting food to people that need it before you throw it away uh, in the food sector. And so we have several goals in this realm as well. Why it matters, here's our food desert. Doesn't show the mile long lines at Fair Park and other places. Um, and we do know that it's not just extreme weather events now that can impact the supply chain. Global pandemic does it too. So we have a request for a competitive sealed proposal on the street for a comprehensive food and urban ag plan. We want to take it beyond community gardens. Community gardens are wonderful for building community but they don't generally um, result in large volumes of produce. Um, and so we, we wanna expand that and um, we'll see how that goes. We will be needing input into that plan as the year goes by. And then originally the plan had seven categories because we felt like everything that we are doing in this plan should improve our local air quality. And when we met with um, the community, they're like, oh, no, 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 not so fast. You need an air, you need a goal specifically to address air quality in Dallas. And that's primarily because we're consistently not meeting the federal air quality criteria for ground level ozone. And unfortunately, even with everyone staying home and not working, um, the 2019-2020 data didn't make our deadline. And so we're gonna be moving from a designation of non-attainment 
to severe non-attainment. And what I suspect that will mean is a little bit more serious attention uh, to the transportation segments uh, for um, not just Dallas, but North Texas in general. Um, the COG is looking at what they're calling uh, travel demand strategies, which is hmm, people working at home. So, so stay posted on that. I, I think it's gonna be really interesting. In a way, it really helps us towards implementing the CCAP because the things that we have in the transportation sector, section of the CCAP should also help us uh, towards the regional air quality goals. And with that, I'm gonna skip. Um, this is the area where actually we've got four goals and I'm really proud of us because we've got three of them done and one is underway. Um, we worked with the TCEQ to get an additional uh, regulatory air quality monitor installed uh, off of Pilgrim Drive. Um, and as soon as that is uploaded to the system, we're, we're doing a little bit of um, data truthing, if you will, on making sure that we're getting the data from the unit um, to the, the data portal. Um, it'll be available. Uh, we also finally got the Breathe Easy Dallas project implemented with the Nature Conservancy, Texas Trees, and Texas A&M. Uh, these are non-regulatory monitors. And this is where we put them. The dark blue is um, uh, percent household poverty. The red dots are where we've had absenteeism in the schools of up to 28%. So it's high pediatric asthma, high household poverty. For um, a control, if you will, site nine, which is blue, is also in the same poverty range, but for some reason, those children um, are not having as many problems with pediatric asthma. And so we're pulling some data there to compare and then the green dots are where we've got relatively low household poverty and low pediatric asthma. There is some other things going on in those neighborhoods where we're a little curious about the air quality data. And so those are the Breathe Easy uh, Dallas uh, locations where we now are getting uh, daily air quality. And it's pretty interesting. We started looking at it. There's one uh, near the X-Line um, Community Center and we were comparing the data with the regulatory monitor at Hinton. Um, and we couldn't figure out why there was a big blip on one of, one of the days. And I had been down there that day and they were, they, it was under construction. And so the monitors were picking up the construction project that was maybe 50 or 100 feet away. So that, that was kind of interesting and gives us a pretty good feel for how accurate the non-regulatory monitors can be. Um, we're working on Air North Texas. The other AQ4, in my mind, is critically important. Um, what we're doing is we're working with the GIS folks in our planning department. We're mapping every site that we has a release, whether it's air quality, whether it's uh, contaminated soils, uh, groundwater, um, where they've got stormwater. Um, as a GIS exercise to support the update to our land use plan. And I don't know that this was done when we did Forward Dallas to start with. Uh, in my mind, this is critically important um, to being able to move forward and, and really look at environmental justice as we move forward with our land planning efforts. So external, we have the task force. Um, our friends, um, Brittany has done a fabulous job keeping our uh, website up to date and sending out emails. Our outreach group um, with the uh, advent of COVID really did a pivot. Um, they were, they're people people and they really like meeting in person, um, chatting with people, kidding around, giving them a little shot skis, but you don't do that in COVID. And so they've reached out to uh, the Dallas Public Library, they've reached out to code, and we've gone almost virtually solar. With, I mean, not virtually solar, but virtually, um, we've gone virtual with all our outreach. 
Um, they're doing three and four workshops a week. Uh, they're, they're reaching different age groups. Um, they've really done a fabulous job of just doing outreach in a different way. And I'm sure being the people, people that they are, they will love it uh, when everybody um, gets vaccinated and we can meet in person again. But I really like the way that they've innovated our programs in the meantime. There's Dallas 365 on the city manager's website. I think our website is better. And then the other thing that we did, and I don't know if Katie Evans is on here or not, but she did a sector by sector where we are as far as progress in the different sectors. And you can see water is really kicking everyone's rear. Um, and it's mainly because it's stuff that they already had in the works. Um, but we're making really good progress across the board. This is just the first quarter, so end of December. Um, our next data poll is at the end of this month, and I anticipate that we're going to make another leap forward. Um, oh, the other thing, I was like, what is this one? So the, the other thing that we're doing is um, when we did the emissions inventory to support development, the CCAP, we were really excited. Our goal was to reduce by 38%, and to 2015, we did 40 and we projected forward to 2017, uh, and it's a 68% reduction in emissions. That's really, really good. Our consultant for the CCAP said, well, you know, that's 2015 data, this is 2020, we really need to do an update. And we told him no, because we didn't want to slow down the plan, but we also know that we really need to be looking at those emissions every, probably now we've got it in the plan is every three years. Um, and so we wanted to do an update to the greenhouse gas inventory this year to see how we're doing. 2020 is a really weird year for air quality data. And so we will be doing an update this year, but we're going to use 2019 data as being more representative of where we are right now. With that, one of the other things, and I'm almost done, um, and FAR's on here, and so I'm going to let her interrupt me if if she needs to, but um, recognizing that the city of Dallas can't do this by ourselves, we went to COG and said, you know, you've got this sustainability committee that isn't really doing much. What would happen if we did a regional group to look at climate planning on a regional basis? And we were joined by Denton and Plano and I think Louisville and Fort Worth and, you know, the COG, when the cities are telling them they want to do stuff, kind of sort of have to do it. So we have a new coalition. Um, it's Regional Integration of Sustainability Efforts. Um, and it is looking at a regional greenhouse gas inventory, um, looking at some of these regional transportation things, um, and looking at regional mitigation and adaptation strategies. Um, I'm really excited with the work that this group is doing. Um, Far Andrews is actually serving as the chair of this group, um, and she's done a great job with getting everybody on the same board. Um, the other thing that they have done is they worked with Burlington Northern to get a grant um, to support getting the ICLE model, which is the international standard that we use for greenhouse gas emissions. And so that smaller cities that may not be able to do that on their own um, can use this grant to join and um, get their own uh, emissions inventory done for these other cities. And so I think it's a really, really good way to get our friends in other cities um, to kind of join in and help with this effort. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we did is last summer um, when COVID was raging, and it was before the CARES Act passed, we were frantic that we weren't gonna have any money to do to implement the plan. And so we did about 10 different grant applications. And one of them was this grant by C40, the Carbon Disclosure Project and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And it is a city business climate alliance. And we applied, we thought, what the heck, why not? We need all the help we can get. Um, Dallas was one of eight cities selected internationally to participate. 
Um, and it is a three-year program to work with our business community towards implementing the CCAP. And we are, we're at the very beginning part of what that program really looks like, but we're really excited about it. We've been on calls now, um, and it's really interesting because the calls are usually pretty early in the morning so that we can get the people from Europe on the same line along with the West Coast. Um, but already we've gotten some great ideas uh, for ways of engaging our business community, um, ways of implementing different programs uh, within Dallas to make it work. And so we're, we're kind of excited about this partnership as well. And with that, I am good for questions. I'm gonna unshare. And anything hard I'm gonna make um, either Brittany or Far answer. <laughs> Sue, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, it's it's an enormous amount of, of information to try to take in. So let me let me start with um, a question that's that's come in several times. Uh, it has to do with uh, how can people access the slide deck. Uh, it, would you let people uh, have copies of the slide deck? Sure. Would you turn a, a set of, of slides over to the feds so that the feds could push it out uh, to, on their networks. Uh, talk a little bit about access to the slides, please. I am. I'm happy to share it. Um, we can do that a couple different ways. The only challenge is I like to use lots of pictures so it's not too boring, which means it's a really big file. It's about 75 megs. Um, I can save it as a reduced size um, PDF if that helps and we can either post it on our website or I'm happy to ship it over to you and you can post it. Um, there's nothing in this presentation that is secret. Um, and so we're happy to share. <laughs> yeah. So oh, yeah, Susan things? and Roger for um, just so for a second. Um, Susan, if you can get that to Roger, Roger, if you can end up emailing that to me or one of the feds, we can put it on our website. Sure. Okay. So that any of the feds will be able to access it um, and be able to get, you know, get the information. And then we'll also be able to pull it because what I would like to do is use some of the information in your presentation to send out as like kind of memes and social media facts. Um, sure. And I want to take pieces of that from different ways. So if you could do that, we'll facilitate that. I'm happy to. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Roger. So uh, Sue, another another informational question. You you mentioned several plans that are in the works: the the Dallas Mobility Plan, the Sidewalk right. Master Plan, the Dart Plan. Several people are not entirely clear about where they go on the city website to have input to those plans and would like to be making input. Ah, uh, I share your pain. Um. <laughs> It's supposed to all be on the main city website, but it isn't. Um, and I even have to root around. I usually find access places like Twitter rather than in the main website. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to make it easy because particularly that sidewalk plan I think is critical. Um, and the DART plan, which is in the, even our stuff, it's on DART, I think is really, really critically important. Um, my worry is I'm never going to get people out of their cars if they, if, well, I know from personal experience, it takes me 10 minutes to get downtown if I drive. Um, if I take a bus, it's about an hour and a half. Yeah. And so it's like, that's kind of a, kind of a no brainer. And so if they can make it more conducive for people to do the right thing, people would, I think. Um, I can find and send the links to you, Roger, if you would like. Yes, that would be, again, that, that would work. And I can, I can make sure it gets pushed out on, on all the Fed's uh, social media and, and maybe in one of the, the upcoming emails that goes out to all the Fed's members. And we'll be sure we get that information out because there are, there are people on the call who, who want to have input to one or more of those plans. Sure. I've got some questions about those even prior to the meeting. There's, there is a lot of concern about how do we transition to public transportation if there isn't adequate lighting, we can't walk to the, to the station. Well, and that's why uh, we've got the lighting thing in there. Routes. And 
similarly, there is concern. I know this is an issue that, that uh, has come up in some other conversations you're part of, like on the NT Reg uh, email list, um, bicycle lanes that have protective curbs. Um, <laughs> You saw my response on that, did you? <laughs> I did, but I think it, I think it would be worth hearing here uh, because there are a lot of people in the feds who are, are avid bike users, more who would use it if they felt safe using it. And, and that too contributes to the solution. So Yeah, so I think bike lanes are critically important. The, the city is implementing overall the bike plan finally. Um, the challenge is I'm not sure everybody understands that having a separated bike lane is really comforting to most cyclists. Most cyclists don't really want to be a hood ornament. Um, and most drivers don't recognize paint or cyclists as being valid on the road. Um, and so I think having at, at a minimum uh, little chicanes to keep people from driving and it's physically vertical uh, to separate, I know that's what they're doing on Commerce um, and or a curb like they do in Austin uh, would go a long ways towards helping more people feel safe cycling. Mm -hmm. And that, that is in the plan. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so it is in the plan, I understand. <laughs> um, let, me, let me ask a question that, that I know um, the three of you in, in the office uh, aren't involved in, in, in political action, but the feds are a political action group. We're going to be uh, talking to uh, city council candidates and, and trying to pay attention to their positions on all of this. Do you have advice or recommendations for just citizen activists about ways they can, actions they can take to, um, to help you all get this plan implemented, make sure it stays on track? What would you like to see coming from, from community activists? I'm going to let... Um... Far and Brittany answer this one. And the reason is my washing machine froze um, during snowmageddon and the guy just showed up to fix it. And I so I need to let him go do his thing real quick. So I'm gonna let well, Far and Brittany. Thank you very that. much. Good luck with you. Good luck with your washer. We'll, we'll okay. turn it over to Far or uh, or Brittany Haley. Uh. You know, so um, I'm Far Andrews, the senior climate coordinator for the city of Dallas. And uh, Roger, I'll take a stab at this one because this is a very interesting question that we get quite often. Um, how, how can people be a part of this process? How can you, how can we help is what we hear a lot. Um, and I think one of the biggest ways to help is, you know, commenting on those ongoing planning efforts. Like, I feel like what made CCAP um, so successful is that we received over 10,000 comments. We read those comments. We knew not only what businesses wanted, but what residents wanted. And we were able to make a plan that could be successful in Dallas. Um, Sue mentioned at least five planning processes that are going on right now. And that's just an opportunity to really um, get your voice heard and get yeah. your concerns incorporated. Um, that's the easiest way to um, be a part of uh, be a part of the change. I mean, the, the planning process, I think, is, is an easier way. Also, you know, contacting your elected officials, um, which will probably, like, redirect you back to the departments, and then you'd be funneled into the planning process for the plan. So I think the most direct route, um, and if Sue's sharing those links with you, and you guys um, have, um, want to want to share your thoughts. Yeah, we, we do read those, and um, yeah. they, they are taken into consideration. So that, that would be my number one um, thought. Yeah, I, I would assess their knowledge of and their support of the uh, recommendations in the CCAP. Um, and, and, and likewise, towards electrification of buildings, towards transit. Um, the other place that we ironically have a lot of challenges and I think those of you that live on Forest Lane that doesn't have any trees anymore understand that. Um, what we find is people cheerfully pay the whatever it is to the reforestation fund and go ahead and cut down the trees. Um, that's a concern. We need people that are, that's, 
carbon sequestration. Trees are also in that middle of those three circles. They do all three functions. Yep. Um, and so I would advocate for people that will advocate for green space um, and not just go for the density. Um, housing is critical. Housing near jobs so people aren't driving across town is critical. Um, and so, and, and housing that people can afford is critical. Um, I anticipate that we will see some changes in our energy world. I'm hoping they are positive changes. Um, I encourage your involvement with the legislature because they've got a whole bunch of stuff on the slate that is not positive. So do pay attention to them as well. Um, but, but, you know, I, I know because I heard about it, the, a friend of mine is actually running for council. She is as green as you can be. She's fabulous. And I thought it was hilarious that she wrote my name on one of her letters. I'm like, well, I really can't do that. But, <laughs> but, but she, she walks the talk. And that, to me, is, is critically important. Are you walking the talk with respect to what you're advocating for others to do? Um, and, and I think that's important for any public servant, not just environmentally. Yep. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much in accord. I think that I think the climate rats are going to be really urging uh, members of the feds to uh, not just ask city council candidates if they if they support CCAP. That's a little too easy. But but how high on their priority list? Are how they are they going to support it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and actually, how, actually you can ask them if they've even read it because it's it's a pretty hefty read. Yep, yep. The other thing that I'll, I'll just say to people on the call is that is that uh, we will be. Um, I'm working very closely with Rita Beving, uh, who who is a lobbyist for Public Citizen, keeping an eye on on all the climate related legislation in in the Texas House and Senate. And we're going to be putting out some recommendations to the feds for bills that you will want to take action on with your uh, representative and your state senator. Uh, some of them are good. Um, some of them are very bad. And uh -huh. some of them, um, Rita Bevin just calls plain ugly. So um, <laughs> we're going to be pushing information out about, about action in the, in the legislature very quickly. Um, the deadline for bills has passed. Uh, look for look for action from us coming up. Let me ask let me ask another question that's a little tougher and it, it does get into the politics of all this. Um, we we know that that there is a very small number of corporations um, in the fossil fuel in industry who are responsible for a huge percentage of of global emissions. Um, do cities have any any mechanism any role to play? In, in putting pressure on, on specific uh, companies or industries um, to reduce their emissions or to have a plan for reducing emissions as a, as a condition for doing business, either in the city or, or in the region? Or, or is that simply outside of what cities can do? It's generally outside of what cities can do. Um, I am having some conversations with our retirement fund uh, relative to potential divestiture. Um, and, and we've had some people write into the website about that as well. Um, because really, again, you put your money where your mouth is. Yes. I don't know that our, our retirement fund is there yet. And I think the challenge is I have to find some comparable investments that they can do instead. Um, is so there, if that is makes there sense. That, is there a way that people in this group could could have input to that push for divestiture? Yeah, uh, write the ERF and, and request it. Don't uh, say it in words. ERF not... is Employee Retirement Fund. Thank of you. Dallas. Yes, Wor words are better than acronyms. Sorry, yeah. sorry about that. And and where would we do that, Sue? Um, I think they have a website. I may have to find that link for you too. Yep. Uh, I think that I think that um, groups like 350.org have been pushing divestiture as as a major strategy for a long time, and uh, and especially getting cities to to divest their funds is a priority. Um, 
So I, I would love to push out that link as well for how people can. Oh, edit. Brittany just put the link in the in the uh, chat. Thanks, Brittany. I got to get all the way to the bottom of the chat and. Um, Oh, thank you. Yeah, I see it. Beautiful, Brittany. Thanks. Uh, I think that uh, I'm looking, um, as long as you can get all those links uh, to me, and we'll push those out. Um, okay. I think, I think I've gone through, unless I've missed some in the, that have come in in the last few minutes. I, um, I saw Christy Kerr Leonard had some questions about um, composting. Oh, yes. um, and that is something both our parks department and our sanitation department are doing some pilots there. Um, that is another plan that's coming up, although they are not yet open for um, input. And that is the local solid waste master plan. Um, and they will be looking for input. I'm happy to send it your direction um, for how we look at that. Um, organics form about 40% of our waste stream. And so if we can find a good way of either diverting the food waste to people or animals, um, doing some composting, um, maybe even look, we have a project that we're working with our um, Dallas Water Utilities and actually the COG on anaerobic digestion for, for food waste that is not edible. Um, we, we follow the EPA triangle and try to get food to people first. And, and while composting sounds great, it's really at the bottom. And you do that as a last, last ditch effort. So that, that one is coming up. Um, we do have a take a peek program where we have folks just kind of take a peek in your recycling and just note whether it's recyclable material or not. And they do provide education. They will provide outreach if you ask. Um, and so there's some things like that too. Um, that's, I'm looking at a comment by Bill Sass about um, investments in fossil fuel companies. Um, that's another thing that I will mention is more and more, I know that our bonding agency is asking what, not if we're doing anything for climate risk, but what um, the Dallas Fed is, has also quantified with their macroeconomists um, impacts to the economy from ignoring climate change. Uh, the military has identified uh, climate change as our greatest risk other than white supremacy. Um, and um, a lot of the private funders now are looking at climate risk uh, relative to their portfolios. And so I think you're gonna see more people more seriously looking at the impacts of climate uh, on normal investments. Uh, I, I don't think it's just green investments anymore. I think it's, it's gonna be mainstream. Thank you for that. Well, folks, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting the signal from the, the Fed's uh, real leaders. <laughs> that, that we've kept our guests uh, probably overly long. Uh, let I'm me, sorry. before I turn it back over to Brandy, Susan, uh, Farr, uh, Brittany, let me say thanks to all of you for uh, coming back to the feds. I, I've seen lots of, of thank yous and, and compliments in the chat, and I'm sure you've seen those too. Um, delighted to have you back. We will do it again uh, for okay. future updates um, and really look forward to, to continuing our push to. Uh, get people on city council who are gonna promote this and, uh, and get action implemented quickly. Uh, so thanks again for being here. Brandy, I'll turn it back over to you for anything closing uh, from, uh, from the feds. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for, for tuning in this evening for such an important topic. Um, give us a couple of days and we will have the content posted on the website. Okay. Um, I'm in charge of doing that and my ability to um, hack technical advancement is incremental. So just give me, give me some time to do that. If you have any questions, you know, you can contact the feds. We'll get you um, in touch with Susan or Roger. Also wanted to let you know what we have going on next week. We have another map the vote session. Week after that, we're going to have an election, uh, not election, I'm sorry, legislature review for all the important um, bills that have been filed, good and bad, a lot of bad, heads up. I know you're shocked. 
So we'll be covering that on uh, the week after next. So thank you everybody for coming. Have a good night. Stay safe.